online with us today. Uh, I think people are still trickling in, but I do want to uh, get us started because we have a uh, pretty comprehensive and uh, interesting topic that I think is going to bring out um, both comments and interest from a lot of folks. And uh, we want to make sure that there's opportunities for people to be able to ask questions and uh, make comments towards the end. Uh, so just a, a little bit of housekeeping right up at the front. Um, for folks who are calling in online, you can mute yourself and subsequently unmute yourself by hitting star six. Um, we also are able to control um, muting and unmuting uh, a little bit on the back end. Um, however, I would encourage folks, especially because we have a little bit of a larger group today, uh, to um, use the chat box when necessary. And um, you can use the chat box both for posing questions, making comments and whatnot as we go along. We'll make sure to get things answered along the way and definitely at the end. Uh, for folks who are unfamiliar with Zoom, the Zoom platform, uh, if, you, um, if you're sighted and you're using your mouse, you should have a menu bar that pops up along the bottom of the screen uh, that provides options for uh, chat as well as muting your phone, starting video, um, seeing the participants that are in the room, et cetera. So if you click on that chat box, it should open up uh, a separate box and you'll a you're able to see um, communications that people are, are chatting. Um, you should see my welcome message as well as a nice hi Caleb from Chanel. Hi Chanel, <clears throat> thanks for being here. Okay, so with that, I actually want to get started by posing an initial question just right off the bat to everybody here that, that's here and that is, what comes to mind when you think of the future of work? And I'd like to ask people um, to type answers into their chat. This can really just be a free association. So um, it doesn't need to, there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, but what we want to do is just get a sense of the sorts of terms or ideas or thoughts that come to people's mind when they think of the future of work. So I'll pause for a minute, let folks find the chat box and type in some of the ideas that they that come immediately to mind. Great, and it looks like we've got a nice little collection of things coming in. So feel free as we go along to add in additional ideas um, that are coming in as well. Uh, don't worry about looking over the shoulder of your neighbor or copying. If, if some, something that somebody says kind of really resonates with you too, um, you're certainly welcome to kind of make a note of that, especially for yourself and add that in. Because uh, I want to use these a little bit later in our presentation. So with that, I want to start off by introducing uh, John Dunn. He's the Assistant Secretary of Labor um, on Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning here in California. And uh, I want to uh, ask him to give us a quick um, discussion about what an overview of this new thing, the Future of Work Department, that is coming online in California. So John, let me turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just a quick, we're going to talk about the future work department in detail, but I also want you to I encourage everybody to go check out and, and Google the Future of Work Commission. Um, that's more of a 100,000 foot level uh, big think tank operation. They're meeting once a month for the next five, six, seven more months. And uh, I really encourage everyone to go check that out also. There's some great documents already on the website um, through the labor agency here. And the next meeting is, I believe next week down in Riverside, um, or the week after, I'm sorry, um, in Riverside somewhere. So I, it may have already, they may have figured out where they're gonna meet. And, uh, but I encourage everyone to take a look at that too. So, <clears throat> but what the future work department uh, is, is an, uh, a realization here at the labor agency and, and with the governor's office and GoBiz that um, we're undergoing some fundamental shifts uh, 
as a result of automation and the changing nature of work. And as government agencies, uh, we've got a role to play to help that, uh, to, to promote uh, economic security for workers and families and communities. And right now, I, we've got a, a lot of low skill, low wage workers that don't share in the state's prosperity. So um, what we wanna do is create something new. And there's a caveat to this, that this future work department is, is, is not fully approved yet. The governor's office needs to sign off on some of the final plans. We're working through that uh, diligently here. And then the legislature also needs to sign off on it. So it's not a done deal. But this is the idea that, that Secretary Sue and, and other leaders in the uh, administration have come up with. So um, what we want to try to do is, is with this new department is uh, use technology and innovation to, to fight poverty, to create a new world-class workforce development department that's going to implement recommendations from that future work commission. So obviously there's a connection there between the name, but also the, the guidance from the, the commission. Um, and then figure out the best way to leverage all of our different resources to connect workers and students and job seekers with opportunities for reskilling, upskilling, training, um, and then also to align all the services that we offer within the labor agency. Um, so that's the, that's the challenge we've got right now. We, the status quo is that we have an employment development department, the EDD, uh, that does a bit of workforce development through their workforce services branch. We've got the uh, Division of Apprenticeship Standards, which handles apprenticeship, obviously. And they are inside the Department of Industrial Relations, which is a, a compliance and labor uh, wage organization with safety and lots of other things, but they don't do a ton of workforce development other than the Division of Apprenticeship Standards. Um, the California Workforce Development Board uh, sets policy and, and, and kind of thinks big picture. And then the Employment Training Panel, ETP, is also part of that. So those four chunks uh, will come together uh, to create a new department. Um, so right now, the, the, we're going to integrate those four areas. Um, we're going to put them under one department in the uh, Labor and Workforce Development Agency. And then inside that department, uh, it won't just be bringing them in as one chunk and leaving them right where they are and just recreating the same silos. Um, but we're going to have thoughtful and, and real connectivity across the parts. Um, we're going to have mechanisms to link the new department with K-12 career tech ed, uh, with adult education, with community colleges, um, with human services employment programs like TANF and SNAP, BNT, um, GoBiz and, and the Office of uh, Planning and Research will have a connection point here. Um, and then also there's a lot of greenhouse gas reduction funds committed to workforce and that will be a, a, a dedicated component to this, this new department too. Um, somebody asked a quick question here. The department's going under one roof. Will be the Workforce Development Board the Employment Training Panel, the Division of Apprenticeship Standards, and the Employment, or uh, sorry, the Workforce Services Branch from the EDD, Employment Development Department. I'll go slower a little bit. Um, so that's kind of the, the proposal. And what we wanna do within that is strength, use the strength of those, those organizations. So the Workforce Development Board um, does big vision, long game, innovative approaches with policy research. They're the ones that create the state plan for WIOA um, and also uh, create an evaluation or research component to this new, uh, new department. The Employment Development Department um, has 800 field staff that, that provide employment services to job seekers in 80 different locations around the state. And that hasn't always been you know, directly linked to the rest of our workforce development world. Um, they have a great labor market analysis division, the LMID, Labor Market Information Division. Um, and they also help us handle $400 million in federal WIOA funds every year. So um, there's a lot of, of capacity and um, ability to support the rest of these programs there too. Um, some of you work with Employment Training Panel. 
they've got 6,300 employers in their database and almost 200,000 workers served in the last two years. They have a direct link to industry and where the jobs are. And those are employers that are committed to training and retraining and upskilling their employees. So we wanna make sure they're better connected. And then a lot of the folks here are connected to the vision of apprenticeship standards through the CAI grants. Um, and that connection to, to organized labor and to existing apprenticeship programs, but also developing the new ones is a, a, a vital component of this new department. Um, so let me skip ahead. I'm looking at, I, you're not seeing it, but I'm looking at a PowerPoint that we're starting to use to talk about this. Um, just to kind of wrap up, I know we're at 11, 12 here. Uh, one of the important parts of this new department is to, to use data um, to, to, to use data that we have in all the different areas to, to, to drive uh, better outcomes, to measure program outcomes, to leverage existing program data that we have in separate areas, um, and then also to conduct rigorous evaluation and assessment of our programs to make sure that they're effective, that the state tax uh, revenue that we receive for training is used effectively. Um, to look at labor market analysis, uh, to, to find communities of practice and leverage them and create a better peer learning environment, much like what this website or webinar is doing today. Um, and then to provide for accountability and transparency. Uh, one of the areas that we would like to do uh, a better job in, in the meantime right now is, is to help this group with the California Apprenticeship Initiative um, expand and scale and we have data in our systems that uh, we're going to start leveraging and working with the foundation and with SBRA and the, the community colleges to support the existing CAI grantees but also the future grantees that, that have just been awarded and will be awarded in the future so um, we've got a lot of really cool stuff in, in our databases that we're not utilizing effectively yet but that's going to change right now so um, Kind of the last little bit uh, to talk about, and then if I'm looking at it, there's no questions so far, um, is that what's the timeline on this? Um, right now, we're working through uh, setting up an organizational chart. You know, it's a rough outline of what we, we think would be appropriate. Uh, that needs to go to the governor's office and get a sign off on that. Um, and then we'll start talking to the different folks outside of, of our departments that, that need to be involved in, in any additional uh, decision making, Cal HR, government operations, things like that. There's a lot of details that I'm learning that it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, and it's called a, a Governor's Reorganization Plan, a GRP. So that is introduced sometime in January. Um, and then the legislature can make a decision on if they like that or not. And hopefully it moves forward from that and goes into the budget. And uh, we have something on the books in, at the end of the, uh, the beginning of the 2020 budget cycle in July 1, uh, with lots of other work to be done after that. So that's the initial timeline. Um, in the meantime, a lot of these different departments are already working uh, very closely to get themselves organized to make this a smooth process. And it's been really, uh, interesting and, and exciting to work with folks from the different departments that that we've worked with before but haven't really dug deep into to see where we can make connections to promote apprenticeship where are those uh, really good targets of opportunity around the state and uh, what can we do in the meantime we're not just going to sit around and wait for this to happen we're going to start working more closely together now so that's the big picture um, on the future of work department. The last piece, why should you all care? Um, I think you're gonna be able to, to get better support and better, very, very more detailed um, connections to employers and to the workforce development world than maybe you have in the past. So all of our work to eliminate silos in our own world uh, is only going to positively impact everybody else around the state um, to make sure that we're focusing our efforts to support you as, as, as you're out running around trying to create new apprenticeship programs too. So I think that's about it from my end. Um, that was a lot of information to jam at you and I'm happy to answer questions now or through email later on. Thanks, Caleb.
Yeah, thanks, John. I really appreciate the, the overview. It's so helpful. And um, before we transition over to, uh, to Vince and letting him speak, I also just want to remind folks that there will be an opportunity, certainly, to ask questions at the end, but also feel free to drop in questions into the chat as we go along as well. Um, uh, if anybody has any, you know, anything right off the top of their head that they want to squeeze in before we make this transition to John, we can squeeze it in. But use the chat, considering the size of uh, the participants that we have on the line today, we're going to use the chat just for um, managing a lot of the questions that are coming on. Um, so um, I really appreciate the overview. And John, I want to ask you to uh, hang out for um, the the next few minutes here so as other questions come in um, now and then towards the end as well that we have you on the line to make that happen um, and thanks for dropping dropping in um, the information to the, the chat to California Workforce Development Board the Employment Training Panel Division Apprenticeship Standards EDD Workforce Services Branch um, and I believe that's a response to uh, Tara's question about all the departments that are going under one roof so thanks for that and with that, I want to turn over now to my colleague, Vince Kohler. Uh, I should say my colleague, uh, mentor, and maybe uh, workforce guide um, in this world. Um, he's um, been particularly knowledgeable um, and informative for me in um, getting my arms around the idea of apprenticeship and also the future of work just in general. And so um, I want to uh, open um, to turn the line over to him. I know we're getting the slides up. And Vince, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Great. Yeah, you sound great. All right. Great. Thank you, um, Caleb. And thanks to John for leading us off into the future work. Um, it's great to be here with this group again. Um, we, uh, I want to step back a little bit and talk about why we thought of doing the webinar on this topic. Um, it really came from a number of discussions we were having on the TA team, but also we figured some of you were having because of course the future of work discussion is in the media and it, it seems to be everywhere. And so the question is, how does this connect to the apprenticeship development work that you're involved in? Uh, since you know a lot of that work is around making the case for it and part of making the case that we'd like to offer today is some connection between the future of work and apprenticeship and how the two uh, really go hand in hand um, in ways, in many different ways. And some of the ways that they go in hand in hand, I think were already mentioned in that initial chat. It was good to hear uh, some of your thoughts about future of work and what it means. Um, I'm going to um, refer in part um, to uh, some some of the panelists and panel information uh, information that came together from the Future of Work Commission uh, that John mentioned. Um, it's now um, it has had two meetings, one in Sacramento, one in Palo Alto, and the next one, as John mentioned, in Riverside. Um, and again, it's 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 very topical to be talking about this. The the Future of Work Commission is a little bit of a master class in all topics related to the future of work. Um, the meetings are now being broadcast, webcast, so you can participate. The first one wasn't, but the subsequent ones by all indication will be webcast. I do think they're worth listening in on, even if you do it after the fact and uh, kind of zoom through the ones that maybe are not quite as topical to you as, as they might be. Um, so I think um, I'm going to talk a little bit about about both what the proceedings were at the meeting uh, at the Future Work Commission. Let me see here if I can make the um, yeah there we go. Um, get the controls to work. Um, you might be more familiar with the Yogi Berra's version of this quote: the "Future ain't what it used to be." But the original goes back to the French poet and philosopher Paul Valéry. And really, what is meant here is that we can no longer think of it with any confidence in our assumptions about the future. This was this uh, this quote was uh, this was written in 1937. So uh, you can sort of see uh, and imagine what uh, Paul Valery was thinking about. Um, 
one of the points that I'm going to make throughout uh, my presentation is that perhaps the point here is that we should stop relying on predictions so much. But here I go, I'm going to do some predictions anyway. Um, and I'm going to look at, at past prediction, uh, predictions, which is always an interesting way to go about things. So credit here goes to Hal Varian of Google, who uh, actually gave credit to Jason Furman uh, when he talked about this at the commission. Um, so in 1980, uh, this was the headline in the New York Times. Um, and the argument of Harley Shaken at the time was that replacing humans with robots on the assembly line at GM and Chrysler is destructive. Uh, and what is striking uh, is that he argued, uh, and this is an echo, this was echoed at the commission, uh, you know, just last month, uh, he argued that workers should be part of the redesign and not just the victims when they are told not to show up anymore. Some of his predictions were not wrong, but they were incomplete in terms of, you know, the reasons for uh, the displacement wasn't just uh, related to uh, robots. It was actually uh, related to other things, uh, you know, misreading the demands of, of the market and that sort of thing. But we can go even further back. Um, you know, there was an assumption in 1935 that the thinking machines would replace the thinker. And in 1812, this was around cotton. So the, 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 the predictions have been there and there's a through line in them. Um, and of course, uh, back to a more current story and that you've seen numerous uh, stories like that. Uh, you know, some of the predictions around 45% of manufacturing tasks by 2025 will be performed by robots whereas today it's just 10%. Um, and by another uh, study, by the same year, nearly half of all US jobs will be at risk of being lost to computers. So this is kind of the, the prediction, uh, the kind of scarier predictions that are out there. I don't wanna belabor them. Um, there's also this, um, that there is a persistent uh, labor shortage predicted and it will, uh, by some accounts, uh, last 20, 30 years uh, for a number of reasons. Um, they have to do with the demographics. We're gonna talk about that a little more uh, in just a minute. And again, this is to the point that I made earlier. Um, there are dozens and hundreds of studies and what they have in common is that they are uh, all over the place. And so one way in which we think about the future is that uh, our prediction about the future is all over the place. Um, so I'm going to give you one more, uh, somewhat more positive view, perhaps. Um, and I saw uh, Kristen, my colleague Kristen's uh, more positive view as well. It's a huge opportunity. Fu the whole discussion around future of work is a huge opportunity. Um, here's one from Tony Blair. Um, and this was, again, also echoed in a number of presentations at the Future for Commission um, about the fact that it, AI in particular, which is just one aspect of future work, the art, artificial intelligence would allow us to do what is uniquely human. And so that also speaks to the fact that some jobs are at risk or tasks of certain jobs are at risk, even if the job itself isn't but other jobs are not at risk and, and there's some jobs that you know fairly predictably cannot be uh, taken over by, uh, by computers or by machines. So back to the Future Work Commission, even that is of course not the first time this has happened in the history in California. So 1964, uh, the first commission uh, or the last commission I should say on uh, something that we would now call the future of work. It was actually, uh, I, I realized when I read it, read the report uh, that it was started the month I was born in June of 1963. So that's 56 years ago, it kind of dates me. And it was commissioned, it was a commission of all men who talked about manpower. Uh, the only women involved were the secretaries. So when I started reading it, I sort of had this madman uh, sort of picture in my head. But what was also interesting is how uh, even though that, you know, that whole uh, proceeding was dated, uh, the conclusions were quite modern. Um, and I'll just highlight a couple of them. Um, 
they stated right second or third page that there is sufficient ev sufficient evidence does does exist to show that the public and private efforts to ease the impact of this change are not adequate to deal with the current problems and uh, even more importantly uh, the problems stemming from automation and technological ten change tend to center among those already displaced from their work youth seeking their first job and such groups as racial minorities, older workers, and persons living in areas characterized by structural unemployment. If I had given you these quotes, uh, maybe uh, leaving the somewhat antiquated wording aside, um, it would probably have been hard to say which report they came from. Was this the report that we are about to uh, get from the new commission or was it the last report? So that's kind of interesting uh, to consider. And that brings me to another French philosopher quote. Um, it appeared in 1849, by the way, a pretty important year in Europe at the time. So there is a through line as we consider all of these. Um, so let's go back to some of the other insights that came from the commission uh, that are important because we've not really touched on what are some of the elements of the future work. So one is this very simple uh, graph here that Hal Varian put up um, about how automation reduces demand and therefore uh, would, one would imagine uh, in, it reduces the need for labor. Um, it does not uh, increase uh, demand in all areas and of course it increases demand uh, or decrease demand in all areas uh, of labor and it increases demand in other areas. At the same time, um, we have a fairly severe uh, supply issue uh, that's mostly demographically uh, uh, induced. Um, you know, we have a reduction in, in birth rates. We have the great tsunami that frankly I'm part of. So assuming uh, some of those predictions around the demographics are true, um, then we are looking at a, um, the, you know, a situation where the demographic effects outweigh the automation effects. So that's one of the takeaways here, the second one from the commission's proceedings. The first one um, is uh, maybe uh, simply stated that the fourth industrial revolution is about humans, uh, and including this idea that, um, you know, we, uh, maybe we should take the, we, it, maybe we shouldn't think about it in the way of that it is often talked about, which is taking the human out of the robot, but it's more about taking the robot out of the human, meaning there's some tasks that humans could do and have been doing uh, that are really robotic in nature, and those could be handed over to the robots. And then there's all this other more creative work that needs to be done. The question is how ready are we and how ready is the workforce to do those, those tasks? And also, how are they compensated for those tasks? So again, so that's one point. The second point that I just mentioned, demographic effects outweigh automation effects. So it's not actually the fact that the jobs are going away. We won't have jobs. It's we have, we have a huge demand for talent. And the question is, um, are we prepared for those demands? And are the, uh, the, the training institutions, educational institutions, connected to where those demands are and what the needs are. Um, another interesting point that was made by, I think it was a Bill Floyd of the Berkeley School of Engineering. He said, we don't need to have preschoolers learn to code. We need to have them learn how to share. Um, he was not a big friend of getting coding everywhere. Uh, he thought what was much more important is that folks need to still uh, continue to learn how to get along with each other and how to work in teams and that sort of thing which is much more important uh, learning than coding, which is something that actually can be taught, um, you know, when it is needed. Um, and of course it changes all the time. Um, we um, had already had some indication from your chat about the inequity issues that are part of the future of work. Um, and that uh, inequity is actually a, a constraint on economic growth. So it's not just, uh, a moral issue. It's also uh, a, an economic growth issue. And, um, you know, there's a lot of good information on that. Um, I won't belabor the point. 
Uh, the other point that is worth uh, you know, spending some time on is that not all work is adequately valued. So what's interesting there is that this last wave of, uh, of automation that uh, in the 80s that, that the New York Times article talked about at Chrysler, these were um, you know, manufacturing jobs that for some reason were valued quite highly in the economy. So these folks were quite, quite well compensated. There are other jobs that are just as complex and maybe more complex and, and require more skills that are very inadequately valued by our economy, you know, help, helping professions in particular, um, you know, healthcare professions, home health aides, um, and, 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 and related occupations that are quite undervalued. And so the question, and this is really not intrinsically so it does, there's nothing saying why should this be valued less than this other occupation purely say if you looked at it from a skill level now there is there are some explanations um, um, that some of these jobs uh, are jobs that are were predominantly and maybe and st some of them still are predominantly women's work and of course we have this whole inadequacy of compensation um, and gender inequality so there are a couple of things there that that um, that really would make a huge difference, especially because those jobs are still growing. They will be there with, in the future. And so we have to look at that and see that the transitions, the transition effects are addressing the issue of obviously equity and not just equity, um, say geographic equity or uh, ethnic or racial or even gender equity, but also equity across these occupations and across skill sets. <clears throat> and then uh, this is often described as the gig economy. 95%, um, this is an interesting statistic, 95% of net jobs created in the last, uh, between 20, 2005 and 2015 were in alternate work, alternative work arrangements. And so um, here's uh, with a shout out to Kristen Wolf, who's on and chatting uh, vigorously. Um, this really is a, a huge impact. Um, this gig economy is quietly, as, as uh, this quote says, uh, undermining a century of worker protection. And of course, we've just had, uh, you know, kind of a policy response in California with AB5 about, you know, what do we call, uh, what is an employer, an employee, and what is a contractor, and how do we need to redefine some of these terms or clarify some of the definitions in order to make sure that, um, that you know, we are not just basically um, diminishing the protections while we're saying, yeah, there's, you know, we have more jobs, you know, everybody has three of them, but overall, the compensation is going down, and that certainly is related to the fact that the, that the, while the productivity has gone up, the compensation has not. This is also often referred to as the fissuring of work, um, because again, it is a fragmentation um, which has you know some positive effects of flexibility and efficiency, and on the consumer side, that's some positive effects, but it also has some very severe. Um, risks associated with it. And some of them we see already and some of them we, we don't see yet or we're seeing on the margins. So um, that is one of the biggest shifts that is also part of this overall um, you know, picture when we look at it, uh, the picture of the future of work. So the commission, um, again, uh, I encourage you to tune in, um, is looking at what was, you know, this is, this is a work in progress, so nothing is set in stone, but they've discussed sort of looking toward a new social compact for California, which is not a new concept either. That's actually out there. Um, California Endowment has done work on that, sort of creating a, an inclusive, uh, just and prosperous future uh, through some, uh, transformative a form of kind of a solidarity. Um, and the equity piece was, is, is, is central to this discussion. Um, so the question uh, in, in my mind, um, and actually I'm gonna back up here for a second is, so what do you think? And this is, this is really worth um, having a little bit of chat around it. Um, what do you think should be part of um, 
such a compact? What do we need to pay attention to if we think about uh, the future um, and how we ease the impact of the future, especially from your vantage point, um, the vantage point of, of being involved in this training um, of the future workforce um, and the current workforce, um, what do you see as the, the key issues of key opportunities that Kristen alluded to? So um, use the chat and see what, um, what, what are your recommendations in terms of what we should pay attention to. So while that's coming in, I'll give you a few that came out of the commission and some that came out of other uh, discussions. I mean, broadly speaking, the discussion has gone in the direction of making, you know, coming up with policies to make those transitions easier. Obviously, if there's dislocation, the question, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is how well prepared are people to handle those tr transitions? How resilient are we as an economy, which is an indication, of, uh, you know, backing up, um, is how resilient are the workers and those that are looking uh, to make the transition, they're dislocated, and how resilient are our institutions to handle that. Certainly support for training is a key, uh, not just any training. Obviously there's some, I would say even predatory behavior and trying to sell people on training late at night when you know, I, I am up working on reports and I'm looking at some of the uh, ads in late night television and you know, there's a lot of very sexy ads about you know, what kind of training I should be uh, getting into that would you know, certainly give me a, a really positive economic future and not all of that training is actually leading there as we know. Um, I see some really um, um, good stuff coming in through the chat here. The resetting of the value of certain jobs is a huge aspect of that. And so that is uh, something I think the commission is gonna work on as well. Um, and, um, and I think there are some areas where um, that can be done through also, you know, the kind of certifications, the kind of degrees and the kind of certificates that are out there that are available that create a, a little more of an equal playing field uh, across these occupations. Um, and then a big point was made, and this is where we are going to transition into the discussion about apprenticeship, uh, that the training needs to be more personalized and in the workplace. Um, good points about it identifying and ad addressing the causes and barriers of structural violence. Uh, very, very uh, good point. And again, a point that came up before the commission as well, that there, this, these are not uh, accidental some of these things. Some of them are potentially unintentional, but some of them are quite, um, you know, they are part of a structure and we have to look at that structure and make sure we, we work on that. Um, and then uh, a big point that has come up, but probably not enough yet, next month uh, or this, yeah, the November meeting and November 14th that John mentioned will be on jobs, education and training in Riverside. And we expect to hear more about, uh, about the need to move from programs to systems, that some barriers that we have are, are that our systems, again, are not quite uh, up, to, up, to, um, up to the needs uh, of, of certainly the, the economy as we, as we are even in now, let alone where we're headed. There's some good uh, points here um, about incentives to employers, uh, which, is, which is very good. Um, you know, especially John mentioned the employment training panel, the employer training panel, um, which has a, a role to play in terms of helping uh, companies uh, address the kind of transitions they're experiencing and retaining the workforce and allowing them to retrain the workforce so that they don't have to go through the layoff and the restart and the job search and, and try to fit into somewhere else, but perhaps can be retrained within the company that they're on. Um, so let's connect the two uh, strands here, the strand of um, the future of work discussion 
with the um, apprenticeship discussion. This graph, you, many of you have seen before, uh, is, is sort of the, th the connection uh, really between the two comp, uh, discussions. The, the red line saying that, you know, getting a job with minimal education used to be possible in the 50s. More than 80% used to be able to do it today. Uh, fewer than 10% can do it. Uh, this is, speaks to the demand of post-secondary education. Our answer has been traditionally, that means college for everyone. Now we're seeing college for everyone is not, um, currently we're not, we're not succeeding. Uh, and uh, on top of that, the college that we are currently offering is not always the college that employers say is needed for that, for, and, and certainly our job seekers are finding that. So not, they're, not, they're not graduating at the rates that we would like. And when they graduate, the employers say, well, not really ready for the market. So the other lines that are important here, tertiary or post-secondary education line is up. That's the, the green line. The blue line is up and the, the orange line is up, meaning we, uh, workers need to have experience. They need to have soft skills. And the question then is, where can they get all of that? And of course, the answer Oh, there's one, one more element that we should talk about, which is the degree gap. I'm not, I'm not going to belabor it. Um, it. It relates to the fact that I just raised, which is that, you know, employers, while they still rely on degrees um, to measure uh, and to, to use as a filter, are actually finding that degrees are not a good predictor. Uh, but they're still the best way to in their minds, uh, although some employers have shifted their views on that, uh, one of the ways in which they filter and, and, and avoid having to deal with thousands of applicants and, um, and instead just deal with, with folks that have a degree, even though the degree is not a predictor of the success in the workplace. So how does apprenticeship become one of the ways in which we address the future of work challenge? What is apprenticeship? Um, allow us to do? What is that? How, how is that tool um, in a series of tools that we have at our disposal? How could that play a role? Let's shift the conversation. Feel free to chime in on the chat again. So there's some very good stuff coming across here. Um, so what is it that is unique about apprenticeship? Um, and Kristen's holding back so that she's giving everyone else a chance. I like Caleb's response. Part of it, I think, is, and we've done, we've studied this, um, and you're in the middle of it. It's, I, I raised this earlier. There's time for us to stop predict, trying to predict the future. We will always try to do it, but of course, part of the reason we're not good at it is, is it's the future, and the future is not here yet. Um, so, the one of the key questions and one of the benefits of an apprenticeship is that. Your, the employer and the employee are part of building that future. They're in it, they're in the middle of it. And in that sense, um, you could argue that the future becomes the present. Um, and that means that you don't have to predict um, in the same way what skills in, uh, individuals need in the future workplace because they're in the workplace and the, fu the future workplace is evolving in real time and therefore, um, if you're in it part-time uh, while you're in the apprenticeship, perhaps, especially if you're a youth, youth apprentice, you're not there uh, full-time, um, you're actually uh, becoming part of that future as, as it evolves. Um, so that really is um, part of the, you know, perhaps the biggest asset. Um, the future becomes the present. I had to sneak in a couple of photos here from my hometown um, just because they're sort of good examples. At the top is a self-driving little bus that's made by a French company. It also is, is running around in the US in different places. Um, it is connecting a tourist magnet 
um, with the train station. And it runs out autonomously on a loop um, back and forth, no driver in there. People step in, step out. So again, future work. Now, a driver less in the public transit system, but obviously this thing had to be built and has to be maintained and so forth. And you can imagine a bus mechanic, this is electric. A bus mechanic is now maintaining computers and electric motors, not diesel. Um, same with the bottom uh, bus. These are electric buses. In just a few years, all the buses will be fully electric. And so again, um, uh, there's a good example at Mission College in uh, Santa Clara County um, about their uh, apprenticeships and how this is something I learned when I toured their facility, how buses have 20 to 40 computers, I think, each individual bus. And so a lot of that maintenance is, is computer maintenance. So again, the future becomes the present. If you're in that workplace, you're learning all those things in real time for a college or a training institution to try to predict what is the what is the timeline of when these skills are necessary it's really impossible so um, those are some of these examples um, so um, I, I see uh, some very good uh, points including the youth apprenticeship um, point of course that's that's music to my ears um, starting in high school. Uh, very important reasons why we should start younger than we currently are. Um, our average age is too high, uh, both from an economic perspective, but also because we are actually putting youth at risk of falling into that gap and not being as prepared as they could be um, when they could um, be ready for, you know, they really need to get into the workplace earlier uh, to be ready and uh, companies appreciate this. So here are the four ways in which uh, the model works so well. Um, it is multi-modal, it's, modal, it's resilient when you think about some of the stressors that we've discussed earlier that come with the future of work. Innovation is key in the future of work. Innovation happens when you bring new people in the workplace, young people in the workplace. Many of the companies that have apprentices say, that the questions those apprentices ask are the things that can allow them to continue to innovate. And if you think about the digital um, gap, the digital knowledge gap between that's generational, um, you know, it turns out um, in the past, we may have thought that young people are not as prepared for the future. Uh, it turns out now they're ahead of us for sure when you look at how they use uh, the digital technology. And so many companies are bringing young people into their midst because they want that digital literacy, uh, again, where young people are ahead of most of us. Um, so it is a way to get the best talent in there. It is good for retention. It increases productivity. So there's, there's, there's obviously a number of reasons why. And the ROI is positive. I mean, you all have seen this graph, I'm sure. Um, the ROI for apprenticeships can be positive. It doesn't always have to be positive. You have to make sure that you get the, the learning duration, the program duration right. It has to be long enough for the company to recoup the investment. And it can't be, uh, so in three months or six months, that's probably not possible. Uh, in a couple of years, yes, it is possible. And it is easier when people are younger. That's another reason for youth apprenticeship because of course you don't have to pay a high school age youth the same as you would a 29 year old who has a family and is trying to buy a house, um, which obviously puts them in a different category. So, um, and then another key thing, and this relates to equity really is how do we connect apprenticeship to college and to credit? There's some good new work. There's a paper, I'm gonna uh, put up the link one more time at the end uh, from uh, Lou Tesfaya at New America about how to connect uh, pathways, um, uh, you know, uh, to, that, that relate, that, that result in post-secondary credentials through apprenticeships. And so that's kind of a key in creating a better, more equitable uh, balance between the vocational aspect and the vocational path and the academic path. And it will do two things. It'll, it, it will help colleges um, get 
compensated for what they're doing uh, already uh, and perhaps are doing without being able to collect or get the credit for it or give the credit for it and therefore collect in, in other ways, get compensated in other ways. But also on the um, job seeker and trainee side, um, we have to create some new equivalencies. We have to do some qualification um, work to make sure that that works. It gives them currency that you know some certificate of completion does not give in the workplace. And therefore, over time, also perhaps a better uh, compensation, which is critical. Again, credit goes to um, Kristen here for helping me uh, find this new graphic, um, which I think is, 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 is a good way of sort of summarizing how apprenticeships um, actually help uh, modernize training. We often think of them, or the, the, the wrap on apprenticeship is that it's kind of an old model, but it turns out it's actually a very, very modern model that can help us, you know, get into that new future of work world. Um, and um, I'll leave it there. Uh, in the reading room, I want to place a couple of items um, for today. Um, one has to do uh, is the paper that I just mentioned about creating pathways to college degrees through apprenticeships. Actually, some California examples are cited in there. Uh, one is uh, by Annalise Goger, our, um, our colleague, a former colleague here at SPR, who's now at Brookings, about how free college won't be enough to prepare Americans for the future. And then the paper that I put out a year ago um, with JFF on the future of apprenticeship in California, um, which has sort of some of the underpinnings um, and is probably due for an up update um, with some of the future of work uh, discussion that we've just talked about. So with that, um, I think we're, we're good for some uh, questions and questions for John, questions for me, or questions for each other. And thanks for all the participation in the chat room. This is great. Yeah, it's a, it's a good test of uh, pr proof of concept of proof of test of using the chat as a way to uh, engage lots of folks. And we've definitely had a lot of comments that have come in. Um, so feel free to drop questions uh, into the chat. That's ideal. If you are stuck on the phone um, and don't have access to the chat box itself, uh, in that very narrow case, uh, I'll invite you to unmute yourself if you have a question that you really want to get out. And, uh, and I also want to remind everybody while folks are thinking about if they have any questions uh, that come up that um, we are recording this session as well. And so it will be, it will be posted um, at the CAI hub in the future as all our webinars are. So people will be able to look back at this, um, refresh their memories, gather some of the resources and information that both John and Vince have presented here thus far. And uh, I noticed there's at least an initial question um, kicked off from Kristen um, asking how have others connected future of work and apprenticeship for employers, educators, policymakers, or people? And I think that's more of a question um, for you perhaps Vince than anybody. Well, I, I would be very interested in what others have to say. Um, I do think um, what's interesting in the discussions, whenever we talk to firms and, uh, and they talk about the apprentices they have had, one of the things they talk about, of course, is what I mentioned earlier, which is that they, uh, that they learn from their apprentices and that the, f that the mentors inside their organization uh, learn from the mentees. And so this is interesting. We, we talk about one of the key benefits of an apprenticeship program is the fact that, that there are mentors in those companies and those mentors need a little training, a little bit of encouragement, some are natural or mentors. They just haven't had a chance to mentor anyone yet, maybe. Um, and others are, you know, need a little help. But, the f but they see the benefit to them about how inspiring it is uh, for them to work with uh, those those who start in the workforce. And again, this happens in every job, whether you have an apprenticeship program or not, it's just that an apprenticeship program takes more advantage of that and allows an easier uh, entry point and a, a, a different kind of onboarding over time. Um, so that is kind of key. 
um, I see, I, I see what, um, yeah, I see some really good comments coming in here, um, which is great. Um, that it's not only about diversity and inclusion. In fact, one of the key points that I, I'd, I'd like to mention along those lines is that, um, you know, it is kind of important that we don't think of an apprenticeship, which sometimes companies look at as sort of social uh, responsibility. Um, we're doing this because it's, we're good citizens and good stewards of, uh, you know, in our communities. Um, it's almost like a charitable uh, idea, but it is actually, you know, uh, more than that. It really is about how you relate to the world and how do you relate to your customers. Um, so I would, I would just say that that's, that's an important uh, point uh, that Annie made, I see uh, in her comment about, about the, the, the need to have companies see that as an asset in ways that they haven't. And I think it's, it's good for us to make that easier for companies. That's where if we think of this as a policy and we think of it as a system, as opposed to, you know, each college separately going to a group of employers, um, um, if we can do this more systemically, it'll be a little more easy. It'll, it'll certainly be easier. And I think I like the other point as well, that, that it, she, the hiring manager was tired of how long it took her to recruit uh, talent. Uh, and certainly uh, the need for talent is enormous. And so we have to get better at reaching more employers uh, in ways that connect job seekers to them more quickly. And of course, the bottom line here is persuading employers to be uh, producers of that talent as opposed to just expect someone else to, to train the talent for them. Um, that is key. And again, if you can do that without losing your shirt over it, which, I, which is obviously possible, then, then you're, you're ahead in the competition. So I want to just circle back to, I know there's additional comments coming in, but I also want to circle back and just as a reminder, um, and also point people back to the very first question that we asked at the top, which was, you know, what comes to your mind when you think of the future of work? Uh, and a lot of the ideas that came out at the beginning of this hour, at the top of the hour, was notions around um, creating ongoing transitions, um, you know, forging lifelong learning, innovation, adaptability, and equity, um, the necessity for creative thought, flexibility. A lot of these, like, larger concepts of how we... Uh, roll in and think about the, the system that's going to uh, respond to the challenges that both um, John spoke to and Vince spoke to um, and some of the ways that we can get there. And so I wanted to invite folks as we uh, sign off to take that, if you take anything away from today, that um, notion of how the work that you're doing um, helps to plug into some of those bigger thematic elements of um, moving uh, more of a systems framework, moving more towards um, creating uh, an innovative or an ongoing um, cycle of learning um, for uh, the state as a whole um, and, and all the stakeholders that are involved, employers as well as apprentices, as well as educators, as well as um, all the other um, uh, individuals that are connected to those folks. And I wanted to see if uh, Vince or John in our last minute or so here, if either of you had any final parting thoughts that you wanted to share. Uh, from John's perspective, um, not a ton of parting thoughts. I love the fact I'm looking at these comments and there's a lot of great ideas in there. I really encourage folks again to, to take a look at that future work commission but also look around your area and, and identify, if you're not already, and a lot of you probably are, look for those quality employers and, how, and, and let's talk about a strategy to connect better with employers, to bring apprenticeship to them. That HR person that's frustrated, is there a 
a kind of a, a how-to guide for HR people to take things to their, their CEO or their, their budget people, um, something like that. So that's it for me. And I would just say um, this is great dialogue here going on. Um, I, I would encourage you to take a look at what the Future of Work Commission uh, is putting together. I also would encourage you to write to them and say, here's what, you know, some of the suggestions that were made here, this is information that the commission really um, would like to hear um, and, and needs to hear, frankly. Uh, it is led by the secretary. Um, it obviously, it has, there's a whole host of commissioners, uh, including the chairs and co-chairs, but staffing is by the secretary of labor and by um, folks from the governor's office and the GOBE's office. So there is, this is, uh, this is really strong leadership that directly work in the arenas that you are part of. So by all means, let them know what you think uh, should not be forgotten as we make this transition. Great. Thanks, John. Thanks, Vince, for your comments. And thanks, everybody, for your involvement and uh, plugging in. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. And we look forward to seeing you uh, next month for the CAI webinar series. Take care, everybody.